Uh, good evening, everyone. We're glad you could join us tonight. I'm Jennifer Smith, and I'm a science communicator with Wisconsin Sea Grant. Welcome to tonight's Lake Talk, which is a conversation style event with Moheb Solomon. He'll also be reading from some of his work. He's an interdisciplinary poet from Egypt and the Midwest who is currently based in the Twin Cities. He's presented writing, performance, installation, and video at diverse art and public spaces in the US and Canada with support from a range of foundations and institutions. Holmes is his first book of poems, and it came out earlier this year from Coffee House Press. It's been described as part contemporary nature poetry, part immigrant travelogue, as it explores themes of nature, modernity, identity, belonging, and sublimity through the vast site of the Great Lakes region. He's been really busy lately with readings and master classes in other Great Lakes states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and New York. Uh, but he's back home tonight in Minnesota, coming to us on Zoom here with us in Wisconsin. So we're glad to be with you here tonight, Mohab. Um, our other guest tonight is my Sea Grant colleague, Ann Moser, who runs the Wisconsin Water Library. And she's also the education coordinator for Wisconsin Sea Grant. And if you're not familiar with the library, it's part of Goodnight Hall on the UW-Madison campus. And its materials can be sent anywhere in the state for you to pick up free of charge at your local library. Um, although she's based in Madison, Anne travels all over the state, working with other libraries, literary centers, teachers, and many others in order to build Great Lakes literacy. Um, before we settle in here, just a few minor details to go over. Um, we have one hour, and that includes time for your questions. So you can feel free to put questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Um, feel free to type them in whenever you want, and then we'll just jump in when we get to the Q&A portion. Um, finally, this is being recorded, so you can watch it again later or share it with someone. Um, when it's ready, this will be added to the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant. So without any further ado, I will hand it over to Anne. Um, take it away, Anne. Thanks. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, so in before I begin, in honor of our topic tonight of the Great Lakes and in honor of um, thinking about identity and place, I'm going to share a land acknowledgement um, and I invite all of you to silently consider where you're sitting right now. Um, I'm sitting home in Madison and I'm gonna share what UW-Madison has written. And that reads, the UW occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, as do I, a place their nation has called De Jote since time immemorial. In 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both of the federal and state governments repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW and I respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So I am absolutely delighted to return to conversation with Moab. I met him this summer in Door County. We had a chance to have a, a small event. Um, and so I'm looking forward to kind of di diving a little deeper into these um, ideas of identity, place as they relate to the Great Lakes. Um, so as a librarian and education outreach, per, uh, education um, coordinator, I have been seeking out opportunities over the last few years to bring in art and humanities into the work that we do at Sea Grant. Um, uh, <laughs> I was kind of neat, naive at first. I was like, oh, we need to, to reach more people and, and a new audience. Um, but what I think I'm beginning to really understand a little deeper is that there is more in common that, than we know about art and science. I think they have a lot of um, ways to have these conversations that can deepen our understanding of this place where we live. Um, and so I'm really excited to have this conversation with Ma because we didn't have a chance this summer to talk about as much about your poetry. Um, I just wanted to kind of um, talk a little bit before we turn to you, Moab, about why this is relevant to Sea Grant. Um, and we're going to talk about the Great Lakes, of course, but we're going to talk about identity and place. And these are two really core foundations of the work of Sea Grant, which is kind of a surprise when you think about science. Um, now, when you think about education, it's not a surprise. So place just is drives our work. We, we do place-based education. It's a very successful way to teach. Um, so if you think about the teenager in the back of the room in high school, 
I was that person who would say, why do I have to learn this? Well, when you do place-based education, that why is right in front of them or in their backyard or in their neighborhood. It's so it's very successfully academic. It, it has great outcomes, but it's also socially and emotionally really a, a great way to teach. Um, now, identity is a little more difficult to kind of wrap your head around when you think of our work in science, but education, kids learn through their identity. It is part of all of their learning. So as a librarian, I'll open a book and a child is looking to see their face in that book. Kids learn all disciplines, not just reading and literacy. They learn through their identity. It's, 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 it's a scholarly uh, result. They know this um, for sure. And so thinking about identity and the work we do in education is essentially. And I have to say, considering the last couple of years when we, we, we've had these, these national conversations, we're reckoning with this racial inequality in our country, identity has to be, it's, it's such an urgent feel now in education for me personally. So I've kind of really centered a lot of the work that I've been doing on that idea. So this summer, Moab, we talked a lot about the Great Lakes. Um, we talked a lot about how humans influence the Great Lakes. You know, we've done a lot of things, invasive species. Uh, it's a long list. But we also talked a lot about how the Great Lakes have influenced humans. And so um, maybe we can touch, about, touch upon that a little bit in our conversation. Um, but one thing we didn't talk about this summer was you kind of your story about being um, here in the upper Midwest. So if you would um, be okay, would you like to start by telling your story um, and how you got to be writing poetry in the Great Lakes? And I, you know, start wherever feels comfortable in terms of your story. So. Yeah, um, hello everyone out there. Um, thanks Anne and Jennifer and C. Grant. Um, yeah, it's really nice to be able to follow up in this way after this tiny, conversation we had the day before the 4th of July. The, it was the morning. So, you know, here we are um, in the evening, <laughs> deep in winter. We all want to just sit and talk together. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different ways to approach, you know, that question, of course, because you can just kind of really tell your whole life story, story in, a, in a very kind of just autobiographical way. But um, I guess I sort of feel like I want to tell it in a way that so many people maybe in the Midwest experience um, place, which is that it sort of almost seems really hard to pin down because, you know, we think of the Midwest as sprawling and people talk about it as flyover, you know, flyover land and where does it begin? Where does it end? You know, I live in Minnesota right now. I grew up mostly in Ohio. Um, they both kind of it's weird, don't really think of each other as the Midwest. You know, sometimes here they think Ohio is really like East Coast kind of industrial Rust Belt stuff. And in Ohio, they think of Minnesota as the North. And, you know, it's just it's not really the same. So, um, you know, I find that really interesting. And um, I, I kind of, I guess, grew up not really, it's not that I really, you know, was I wasn't really preoccupied with those questions, but I just kind of more you know, felt like in trying to figure out where I am from. Um, I, I'm from Egypt originally. I moved to the U.S. as a kid with my family. So, you know, where, what is this place? Where am I from? How do I kind of claim it? Um, where do I enter into much longer, like, histories and narratives of belonging and, you know, place here? Um, I felt like I kind of was, you know, groping for a larger logic um, beyond, you know, national identity or, you know, the funny like state identities that we have, you know, everybody's like hyper, you know, state oriented and it's kind of funny and fun. And um, anyway, you know, it's, but there, there's this giant organizing, you know, kind of um, anchor or like magnet in the middle of the Midwest, which is the Great Lakes. And, you know, the it's a really interesting region to think about in that way. You know, it's coherent in so many ways. It's a bio region, you know, um, you could look at, you know, the history of North America through the lens of the Great Lakes and think about migrations and settlement and conquest. And, um, but it's also, you know, a very like fragmented borderland uh, between all the state borders, the countries, the provinces. Um, so, 
Yeah, you know, I, I guess for the longest time I took it for granted. Um, I grew up in Columbus, mostly outside of Columbus. And when I finally kind of got to Lake Erie and later when I was for the first time living on the Great Lakes in Toronto, it just kind of blew my mind, you know, how, you know, vast and yet coherent it is as a place. And um, I think that gave me a lot of, it just really fired my imagination and holding this giant sprawling, you know, land uh, in the middle of the country together um, through this body of water. Um, and, you know, I think I've mentioned this to you before, but, you know, it's, it's this kind of funny thing where sometimes I wonder if it's something I'm kind of holding on to in the same way that I, um, you know, might remember or think about the Mediterranean um, because my family's from Alexandria, which is right on the Mediterranean Sea. And, you know, it's only, it was only six years, but I, I have very vivid memories of it. And that's a very similar body of water. I mean, it's just right in the middle, you know, it's basically closed off at the end. Um, so it, it has a really similar kind of giant sublimity, you know, but it's not an ocean. Um, there's so much travel across it and, you know, cultural, you know, kind of blending. Um, if you think about all of those, you know, countries right along that shoreline and, you know, to end up here and think about the Great Lakes in its own kind of sublime giantness and yet, you know, heavily industrialized, utilized, um, traveled, crisscrossed. Um, sometimes I kind of wonder, you know, if that's a, a part of something I'm seeking or thinking about. And it certainly kind of entered the work um, in, in trying to think about identity and, and, and thinking about being from here, although I'm not from here beyond just my own, you know, one generation. Um, so anyway, I'm, I'm rambling there. But uh, you no. know, please ask for more. <laughs> I missed the point. No, no, no. I'm I'm thinking about you know an experience I had where I was on a Lake Guardian um, ship on Lake Michigan, and and I was out in the middle of the lake. So you you talked a little bit about experiences you have standing at the lake on the on the shoreline, and you know we study that at Sea Grant all the time. And I'm thinking also about the time that I was in the middle of Lake Michigan, and I was standing there, and I was stunned because you know, I grew up on the ocean systems and I'm standing on this lake and I'm doing a 360 and I cannot see land. And it was very discombobulating, I, I have to say. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. and, I, it, and it was a fact I wanted to share with my snobby East Coast people. Like we have water where you can't see the other side, but it was just really right. discombobulating to be in the middle of the lake and not be able to anchor myself. Is that, have you had the opportunity to be out on any of the Great Lakes? Not nearly enough. I mean, I do love flying over. Anytime, you know, I mean, anytime I fly, I just am plastered mm -hmm. to the window anyway, but <laughs> any of those routes where we'll be flying over one of the lakes, I just really love seeing that, you know, and getting a sense of how small and how big and, um, you know, you see those ships like out there right in the middle sometimes. And yeah, it's a pretty amazing and strange um, you know, spatial experience because yeah, we're so used to a lot of, you know, it's just such a populous, populous region. You know, you yeah. think about all these major cities, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, mm -hmm. Buffalo, you know, I mean, we have, and then so many smaller versions of those all over, you know, mm -hmm. Toledo, Erie, I mean, and they just kind of get smaller and smaller, but they're still just so dense. And so mm -hmm. um, they don't really like speak or suggest a speak of or suggest like, that space that you're talking about right yeah. out there in the middle of nowhere, you know? Yeah. It was funny how vulnerable I felt that that surprised me. I, you know, I was completely safe. And um, mm -hmm. so um, Jen wrote this question down. I'm going to ask it because you were talking about borderlands. Um, and so in, in the poetry, you, you refer a lot to porous borderlands. Um, what does that mean to you? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I guess I like pointing out that it is a borderland, you know, that it's, and it's a strange one because, you know, um, if I have it right, and I'm sure a lot of people in this particular conversation, conversation <laughs> I, you know, I'm usually like doing very more like lit based uh, events. And here I am talking mm -hmm. to possibly a lot of you know, ge geographers and scientists. No, but um, it's the largest border in the world between mm -hmm. two countries and at the same time, you know, most of the border is through water, you know, mm -hmm. so it's literally a porous borderland. I mean, it's not also heavily policed. I mean, it, it, you could mm -hmm. kind of, you know, that's up for debate, I guess, but 
I, I guess my point with it is it's that it's interesting that as coherent as it is as a bioregion and as a watershed, mm -hmm. um, it's also this massive borderland for two con between two countries and then all the geopolitical boundaries between the mm -hmm. states, you know, how those form and sometimes it's just a line and sometimes it's a river, you know, or a bay or so. I kind of think that's an interesting tension and mm -hmm. it, it lets us, I think, think of the region as, you know, in, in its human geography sort of context mm -hmm. and its natural geography context and, you know, how those kind of lay over each other. Um, mm -hmm. When, you know, I, I've done like some sort of poetry based performance work using Google mm -hmm. Maps um, Ooh. <laughs> where I, I, yeah, it's like this fun, I really like enjoy this kind of thing because it borders on, you know, possibly really boring, but I think it's really enthralling where it's like a 10 minute kind of live video projection just scrolling across that dotted line in between the great you know or along the great lakes you know starting way up by um you know um grand portage mm -hmm. and just kind of scrolling along that dotted line and you know it can be really hypnotic there's kind of a nice like poetic track that goes with it that i think is interesting and keeps it kind of dynamic but you know you keep kind of moving through those vast blue, you know, empty spaces mm -hmm. with this dotted line that says Lake Superior. And then you suddenly kind of winnow in to, you know, where would that be first? Sault Ste. Marie. Mm -hmm. Then you kind of open back out and then it comes mm -hmm. back into Detroit. And, um, you know, I, I think it's just interesting that it, it is a borderland and yet it just, that's just such a senseless, Yeah. Um, it just doesn't really mean anything mm -hmm. specifically in this context. And then it also questions issues of borders, immigration, um, it kind of allows me to enter some of that subject matter just by mm -hmm. kind of talking about the human and natural geography um, mm -hmm. that, you know, sort of uh, defines what borders are. Um, and, you know, here we are in this vast space that the border is a dotted line. It's so porous, mm -hmm. you know, so we can kind of like, it's kind of an interesting tack to sort of talk about maybe some of those more thorny questions around what mm -hmm. borders are for and mm -hmm. what they do. Well, we can perhaps learn from fish because they don't <laughs> they don't respect borders. <laughs> right. When they when they talk about you know, you know how many fish are in Wisconsin, well, you know that's kind of a silly question, but and, right. And I mean it's interesting too, you know, that in a lot of those spaces, you know, Native and First Nations communities also have a, a sort of exceptional relationship to those borders mm -hmm. because of how those spaces historically developed of course you know those borders cut right through them so you know like around thunder bay and grand portage you know there's a lot of movement in a very different mm -hmm. way than american mm -hmm. and canadian citizens you know who aren't native first nations so that's kind of interesting too you know that they they live it in a different way mm -hmm. Well, um, it's just about time for you to read. So um, I'm going to go ahead and turn off my camera and listen hard. And, um, okay. Yeah, very excited about this. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thanks everybody again for being here and, you know, just being interested in the, the book. And, um, you know, also like Jennifer and Anne were saying, you know, the intersections between art and science um, are just, proliferating. I mean, there are so many, uh, in a very official way, um, you know, you'll see more like science museums that have artist residencies, but, you know, and also, um, you know, um, as, as sort of we have a much more public facing, like, um, kind of need for all of the environmental work that's being done to kind of enter into discourse and for people to understand it. And, you know, the arts also kind of step in and, and it's not just do that work, but have already been doing that work and, you know, more people are looking at it. So I do feel like this book kind of sits um, at that intersection in an interesting way. Um, and I was going to share some work with you, you know, that maybe is a little bit weighted towards that, those themes and, and how they sit together. Um, and then also I kind of wanted to, yeah, you know, maybe share a bit more of the identity kind of, exploration in the book. Um, so anyway, maybe I'll try to just not use up all my time rambling and just share this work finally. I never get to really talk as much as I did here before um, jumping into the, to, to the poems. So this is Holmes. And yeah, it just came out with Coffeehouse Press in June. And I've been completely consumed running around trying to tour it back to all of the places that constitute it. Um, and 
yeah, here I am. Uh, this is maybe my second or third virtual event. It's all really been in person. So it's such a different, uh, different space, but thanks again. So here we go. The first poem I was going to read is very transient. The book is very much a travel log in a lot of ways. And uh, yeah, so I thought I would kind of start off and sort of show that tone. Uh, it's called At Point Peely, Leamington, Sandusky, Cedar Point. This beach has more than two sides, more than the lake and the parking lot, and cultivated and sandwiches, farms, and kiosked beside it, and defies properties. I've peed behind every sort of flora, scared away all kind of fauna. I crossed the lines of R&R &R to bridge the banks of main and head streets and waters. I tried myself, had myself washed ashore to hamlets, face up. The whole time my figure, a petty viaduct, only a shallow beach could love. I swam each day. I changed myself inside the Corolla and diaspora footfuls of mollusky sand all over the motel districts of Canuck Sanduskies, where in touch more with nature is what they are. More than amusement or national park and lark, cedar point and the tip this land does not come to to states, means, ends, nations, and defies commodity, recreations, and conservations. This place has more than the all-night or primitive drive-through and the camping. This whole time my body held in feet of surf, not diverting to the water or exiting, but bridges fail all the time. It's nothing new. Bridges are being built and rebuilt all over these lakes adding sides to no end, defying the accounts of travelers, homing in, pointing out. We came in off the water, not really having been out there. You come out of the water, turn right around, get back in there. I'm going out to the water, never really having left there. Uh, I forgot to set my timer in. I'm going to have to stop me if I'm rambling too much, but I'm going to just move on to the second poem, um, which kind of has that same tone. And I think about it as a bit more of an environmental poem, I guess. And I think the book really struggles with, um, you know, not wanting to kind of let experiences with wilderness or the non-human living world um, be just too paralyzed or shut down by kind of concerns uh, around environmental issues. And um, I feel like this, is, this poem kind of, you know, does that a bit. It's called Lighthouse Lit, Dawn Opaque from Marinette to Menominee. You can hide a lot in fog. I saw no terrace with chairs, hot tub, outdoor shower, ski do and silty lawn and beagle dragging a bikini top behind. After sleeping in it, I was packing the car at dawn. All life seemed out of touch of water and its problems, a lot in fog. No sign but scent of the smoke trout. No breakfast, no idea how to flop back into place, swim to life and drive to death before the cape burns off and leaves the world again to painfully obvious warming. By then the neighborhood will have emptied onto the beach till the beach fills in the neighborhood. How can things be always too late? Always on the lookout for more ice and gas. The climate changes right before you. Know it. A hundred years from today, the moment of efficacy as if it's always already passed and all that's left to do is lie and bask and look out, a giant tanker slowly shredding the horizon, a lot in fog. The next poem I was going to share with you um, is from a very short series in the book called, um, they're sort of the lost cities of the Great Lakes, one for each lake. And um, these, th 
this series came out of just um, in 2015 when I was circling the, the entire region for four months through a fellowship, a really lucky and wonderful thing um, I got to do. Um, and, you know, just it's one body of water. You just really stick to the coast and you can wind up right where you started. And um, I had kind of a protocol where I was trying to go to every, you know, local history museum and kind of look at those, you know, narratives um, in, in such a microcosmic way and see how they added up to kind of a macro picture of the region. And you can get really jaded, I think, sometimes in encountering spaces like that and, you know, seeing just how they, I don't know, how they um, represent themselves so, you know, singularly, but um, they're also so similar to all the other ones. So um, anyway, I'm rambling. So this is called Lost City of Lake Erie. And um, yeah, it's kind of trying to work with that, you know, historical lens in sort of an absurd way, I think. Um, Lost City of Lake Erie. It was a port that sank, not a freighter or steamer or one of Perry's fleet, but a whole port or sailboats. Not leisure, but Peltera Maritime's latest gallivanting technology, fettering the interior with metaled whites. It was a point on the way that La Salle anointed with French flowers. Delete. And Father Hennepin with him, and Seaman and Tonti and Shale Sparks with his steel claw ground. It blossomed into a port city. On the shallowest lake of the whole unmarshaled region, some spot in the marshes before Leamington and beyond ports Dover and Stanley. Personally, I believe it was Rondeau. I met a regiment, I met a regiment of memory there. What it was being foreigns and braves and genuinely God's fearing and raising a palisade and wheat and fermenting a trade zone that dried up, that flooded next spring. The marine life leaves some artifacts untouched on the lake bed, some conjecture, some dive, a book report, the canon. Maps were found with drawings of Marquettes of the Horseshoe of Niagara less crumbled and calculated the distance to the port's crude first European wigwams with arrowed hearts in the parchment's margins, zealots destinations, speciously barked up whole woods of ash and maple abandoned when the faith didn't take. It's murky what happened, what lost, what left the wives, the kids, orphans, chattel, missions, crosses, exed into landscapes. Should have had a glass of water here. <clears throat> well, um, yes, I'm gonna read you another poem that also um, is kind of based on Lake Erie. And um, well, I didn't know which one of these two I wanted to read because these two poems I, I really like because they're trying to work with that tension of how, you know, wilderness and nature in our time are just so heavily managed, um, you know, even more so when they're meant to seem natural open spaces, you know, state parks and national parks and city parks and campgrounds. And, you know, there's just so much, it's a, it's a profession, right? Um, and, and many professionals actually work very, you know, intelligently and with much sophistication to um, build these spaces for us to encounter the, you know, non-human living world um, in a way that feels, you know, authentic and natural and, and yet it's built. And, and um, I think that's really fascinating. And, you know, again, it's just not something you do good to just be jaded about, you know, it's just kind of, that's how it is. Um, and uh, you have to kind of make do. Um, so, yeah, this is a, a poem called Great Black Swamp Come Heavy Use Wetlands, Powers of Toledo Origin Song. It's kind of meant to be a song. Who let this wetland wet? Who cut this little inlet? Laid the hill for golden hours. Fit the logs with the salamanders foretold the lichen and the mosses who offered the wildlife crossing. Along this promenade, I sing about how the world's made my behorned serenade to nobody, but who wet this aggregate? 
who raised this bamboo deck, who had these grasses moan, who made the birches grow in groves, who made this prairie zeric, carved out a space for heron. This is my behorned little dirge. I sing along a little bridge about how this little world's birthed by no body, but who left this river wet? So the embankment set the grade for the slope of the island, spawned the minnows to feed the walleye. Who knows the ripples till flood? Who reads the dried out flats of mud about how the world's mocked up? I sing along this ply boardwalk. This is where the trombones stop. For nobody, by no body but you local, no melody but vocals, as is, la la, la li, la las, la lies, as is. And uh, yeah, well, I have a few more poems I want to read. Maybe I'll get back to this other one if there's time at the end, but um, the other one's a poem kind of It's about kind of a, how real and unreal beaches are. Um, and, you know, that really blew my mind one morning when I was traveling and I got to a beach really early and I saw this bulldozer basically building the beach before everybody showed up. And uh, yeah, it just kind of was a really like profound moment of um, thinking about those spaces. But um, I think I'm going to move into a, another poem that's kind of working in the same way as that Lost Cities poem was, but um, with history, this one is kind of doing it with uh, kind of environmental discourse. And um, I also tried to spend as much time as possible, you know, showing up in any of these smaller places and big or small, um, going to the local science museum or maritime museum or, you know, to kind of just see how they frame some of those um, geographic, geological, environmental issues. Um, and, you know, also feeling, again, that kind of suffocation sometimes in, in trying to recognize environmental issues and language and discourse, but still, um, you know, trying to have like a fully, you know, phenomenal experience with some of these really beautiful places. Okay. This is called Talks at Great Lakes Science Center, SS Meteor Maritime Museum, Marine Museum of the Great Lakes, Great Lakes Lore Maritime Museum, Great Lakes Historical Society, Shipwreck Museum of the, uh, uh, so on and so forth. Fish advisors, hatcheries, carbon and credit dioxide, card deals, oxygen depletion, leachate, oxen, chicken, scat, smelt, and eaten. Research, veto, funding, dung, zoo and phytoplankton, finding, purchase, Zebra mussel, alewife, sea lamprey, purple loose stripe, European buckthorn, exotic species, that is immigration, beautification and eutrophication, lake stratification and turnover from the peopled epilimnion to the deep sunk hypo needling the tepid thermocline, moisture bearing care packages, hydrologic unicycles, suspended particles and articles, the Great Lakes, or a, they're one. When the early Lake Algonquin poured out three ways to the Atlantic and one way to the Mexico Gulf, our region evolved as the first rest area in an era humanless. Land was cut into water by a constant stream of glaciers summering in pre-Georgian Bay. Perverse creatures of the lust to wander camped their proto-RVs in fields of Pleistocene weeds. Minerals were compacted to bracelets, chains of islands big. Civilization was the frontier to nature, and it sprung up everywhere with its vistas, the love of which was only survival for us newbies with balls of eyes, pre-Americans vying with no British for ascendancy of Frenchless and non-native held lands. Not even algae was invasive, but it was nonetheless languorous chaos in the wilderness and skin did grow thick on the teeth. 
and by it time stoically passed. Language was impossible. Vowels confused with consonants. Water and continent were one. Consonants and continents with water and vowels. Everywhere was a sort of water Pangea, a lake somehow floating invisibly in a sea, two Pangeas, impossible. Like your eyes say, two Pangeas, deafening blue, jagged green flake at heart, black iris folding out the dark. First life, life is too, too impossible. A touch away from your face and it's as if I get a look at life from space. The world is too, too land and water, shallow and possible. I wait and 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 wait. I'm just going to read you two more poems. This one, this next one kind of deals a little bit with that kind of autobiographical identity um, piece and, and sort of thinking about, um, you know, narratives of belonging uh, in the region. Um, you know, I feel like this book attempts to, you know, kind of triangulate or sit with the native First Nations, uh, you know, narratives of being here, European settler, and then immigrant narratives of, you know, belonging and entry. And those nodes, you know, speak in really different ways to each other and sometimes not at all. Um, and I think that's interesting, especially when it comes to immigrant and native um, connections and, and lack thereof. So um, anyway, this uh, poem is called Back Parts. I've hit bottom, friends. Rock. To you, your Mediterranean interred sea, where I am from. These are my dad's trunks. These are my dad's calves. These are my dad's chests. These are my dad's hands. This blood, my dad's. The sharks would come, but there are no sharks here. Where am I from, folks? We from. There's no predators here, save storms and waves of immigration. But all over the lakes are shaped like predators. Seething wolf, leering shark, mouths, points, shipwrecks stand. A better chance of a homecoming than the packs of immigrants that beached, that drowned wolf, blinded shark, tongues warped into Wendat and English, naming, maiming limbs of peninsulas. Rickshawed creatures, claims for places that no one wants, stuck together families like amphibious gangs, growing back parts. And the last poem I'm going to read you is one of the few, I think, just totally blissed out ones in this book, because it was a really blissful, incredible time being all over the region. And it's really all just been a thinly veiled excuse to be out there, I think. It's called On the Water. And the world entire would load before your eyes. And there's no more. And cash is clear and all songs stream at once. The sound delayed, avatars retired, and all seasons complete at once, with the earth tilted on its axis no more. The weekend's lightning, languorous, arms stretched after lunch. You can't take more. And the robes are soaked, why they can't absorb another drop. And what's more, washes over unimpeded now, and there's more. The morning after all justice meted out, all grudges would be lost in the cloud, and power would go out, and all leisure would be more radical then, and the fight would go out of you with the world at your fingertips, guiding your hand to the ends of luxury it doesn't get any better than this. There's more of the same. And who could want more?
that's some of this book homes. Okay, thanks, Mohab. That was great. Thank you. So I think we'll move into some more questions. You have Anne's clapping virtually <laughs> across the internet. Um, yeah, so I think we'll launch into some more questions here, um, both some of our own, and then we're getting some in the chat. So if that's okay with you, okay. we'll kind of keep rolling with the conversational part. Um, this one thing I wanted to mention, um, I'm also here with a, whoops, hard to see with the virtual background, but I'm also here with a copy of Holmes. And cool. I thought it was really interesting to hear you read these. Um, you know, in some cases I tried to flip to the page and follow along with you just because, you know, if people haven't seen the book yet, just things you're doing on the page with, you know, line break, the kind of white space on the page, you know, it's interesting. Because some of the poems in particular, yeah, like what you're showing, the poems, some of them have a very kind of square look, but then with that space in the middle, you know, just those little yeah. pauses, I think are really interesting. And so I was, as I was reading this at home, I was thinking, you know, what it would be like to hear you read them. And I even read some of them out loud to myself just to kind of play around with your language. So that's been fun. You know, to see that's so nice. Kind of how you read them. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one thing I wanted to ask you is that each poem, you know, another thing about the book, if people actually look at it, um, each poem in the upper right, you know, the title is there. Um, it almost makes me think, you know, the way that the title is tied to a place does give it that feel of kind of like a, a travel diary. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously right. the language is much more thoughtful than a dashed out diary, but there is kind of a diaristic element or... yeah you know, keying each poem to a particular place. And I, I wonder if you could just talk about that because, you know, yeah. it's obviously your memory of a place, but it also gives that specificity for your reader. Because I'm guessing a lot of people who will read this are Great Lakes people too. Like right. you recognize some of these places. Like there are a couple of poems where I'm like, yep, I've been there. I know what he's getting at. And so if you could yeah. just talk about that kind of travel on. Yeah, thanks for, follow. right. I mean, you really nailed it. Um, we talked, we, we thought a lot about formatting, you know, I didn't want these poems to have titles. I kind of stupidly didn't put a table of contents in the book. And now every time I read, you know, I'm like flipping around trying to remember where something is, but it was kind of the titles in a way, it's not that they're an afterthought, but the, the point is the writing, you know, and, and I wanted the titles to reflect almost kind of in a side note, you know, like when you're writing, the t you know, in a journal or a log or something, it's just kind of on the side. And, and yet I think they give the poems a lot of needed grounding um, because they're so associative and they wander and so you know in a way I would say like some of the poems they almost have nothing to do with the title I mean it's not that the poem is about the place it's just that that was the setting to start thinking about not just that place but you know the dozen other places that it's tied to and I think that's such a true you know, that's like the condition of the region. You know, there are small, tiny lumber towns way up in the middle of Canada that have Chicago really large in their mind because they existed to basically produce lumber for this, you know, American city. And so I, I think that's really interesting. And, you know, it, it sort of questions the notion of place, you know, is it just the physical place and, you know, how much of it mirrors or echoes other places, which is again, so true in the region, like we're talking about. And the titles play with the scale of a place, you know, is it a proper noun? Can you use the idea of on the water? Is that a place, you know, by the end of the book, that's kind of the, you know, the poem back parts, you know, um, and yet some of them are very long and sort of are about, you know, the short sublime jurisdiction of Pennsylvania, you know, it's about the tiny stretch of Pennsylvania's grab of the Great Lakes. And so I really like, like relished the opportunity to just kind of even question the notion of place and how discreet and sort of autonomous it is and you know how it ties into everything else yeah and did you want to ask a question or shall well, i jump to the chat because we're getting um some yeah you know maybe we should get to the chat because there's some really good questions there and i it's yeah, important yeah. to answer those all right i will jump in um there's a question here from kelby and the question is which city did you write about for lake superior I'm also curious if you got to Madeline Island on your journey. Wow. Yeah, I, I sort of almost figure, I feel like the Apostle Islands kind of figure, they, they have a, they show up a lot. I don't know. And maybe, 
the Apostle Islands were just particularly, I don't know, not special to me, but I just, there's just so much going on there. You know, the National Park, the, the, the Native history, Anishinaabe history of Madeline Island and that region. And um, yeah, you know, maybe it's also because I have lived closer to them. So I've visited them a few times and they sort of end up being a part of maybe my story more or something. But um, yeah, well, I, I wanted to answer the first part of the question too. I think you said what parts of Lake Superior mm -hmm. show up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I would like to think that every mile of that shoreline is in this book, um, but it's just that sometimes it's anchored a little bit more around different spaces. Um, Thunder Bay um, is in there a few times and uh, Sleeping Giant, which is a really, you know, kind of beautiful yet weirdly kind of something reckless about that place. Like the deer are a little too familiar. It, it, it has kind of a, it's like wild in like a party sense, not in like a wilderness sense. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting place. Um, uh, Puckasaw uh, Provincial Park or, or maybe a national park on, on the back side of um, Lake Superior in Canada is like just a really, really incredibly gorgeous and you know, it just really blew my mind. Um, oddly, Duluth doesn't really show up. And, you know, maybe because I was overcompensating for how obviously major it would be. Um, and uh, I think the, key, the the Upper Peninsula is like definitely all over the book. And I mean, and I find that to be like a really fascinating part of the region. And um, yeah, Isle Royal is, is in there. I was really lucky to get to visit Isle Royal. Yeah. Okay, um, next question comes from Marie, who's actually a colleague of mine and a poet as well. Um, she's oh. just curious how you got interested in poetry. And I know it's not the only kind of art form you work in, but where did your interest in poetry come from? And has it always been with you? I don't, yeah, I think it has. I mean, I've done a lot of other work, but it's always at the core of it has usually been poetry. And I, I might have just kind of been intimidated by, you know, sort of properly literary spaces and literary people and, you know, MFA programs. And I just didn't go that route, but I have always really been a poet. Um, I just kind of found other platforms to work with poetry that I felt were more, I don't know, open to different people, um, relational, you know, performance work um, is more relational. Um, but sometimes I think that poetry really got, you know, stuck with me because, I mean, in a way, I just feel like it's, in a way, it's like the laziest art form there is because we all use language, you know, it's not like a guitar or a piano or the skill that is required is just so physical. I mean, you have to practice. It's not something that you're accidentally doing all the time. And we move through life constantly using words, constantly writing, whether it's informal or formal or so I guess, you know, between what I feel like is a, a really sort of inherently human um, art form and as someone who was learning English as a second language, so I maybe was just kind of extra stimulated or extra aware of language as a construct and like mastering it was kind of a do or die we were living in Oklahoma when I first moved here. So that's, you know, really, it's not a very diverse place. And, you know, you really have to kind of jump in there with everybody. And so maybe those, between those two things, it just kind of really held. And um, I, I worked with it. Okay. Um, here's another question from Tom. Um, he is curious if you have some other favorite Great Lakes writers. Oh, wow. Wow. Hmm. Well, it's interesting. I mean, so many, um, so many writers that come to my mind are ones that just were really stimulating to me, but not in terms of poetry. You know, there's like the death and life of the Great Lakes was really fascinating to read um, by oh, just escape my mind, but I'm sure you all know who, who's the writer. Dan that. Egan. Right, right. And um, there's another guy whose name is Jerry Dennis, I think, who's in Traverse City, who sailed all around the Great Lakes. And I mean, I just kind of really 
get into having an excuse to like dig into this body of literature. You know, there's a really pr problematic historian in a way named Harlan Hatcher who wrote um, books in the 60s about each of the Great Lakes. And, you know, it's really just fascinating to look at such a dated perspectives. And, and yet the, the perspective is so dated, but it's so deep. It's, you know, he really, he loves the region, as do I. And yet, you know, you see how he's framing history, how he's framing industry, environment. And um, so I'm giving you people not to read uh, as I answer your question. Um, but, you know, the, the more I've traveled throughout the region with this book and done readings, you know, of course, like everyone who's based in the region in some way is writing about this ocean in their backyard you know it's interesting you know even people who don't consider themselves nature poets are working so much with that um subject matter so anyway yeah i'm I, sorry i'm drawing a blank on just sort of saying here read these four people <laughs> but um, maybe it'll come to me in the next one sure sure um here's another question for you this is just kind of my own observation or thought um you know as somebody who is from the great lakes Sometimes when you hear the phrase Great Lakes, you know, the first image that comes to people's minds is, you know, kind of grand vistas, pristine spaces, state parks, and that's all there. Um, but your poetry also has these other angles, you know, kind of the tourist traps, the industrial towns, the small cities, you know, because, you know, the RV parks, there's, there's a mix of places and images, you know, that are also part of this vast Great Lakes region. And so, you know, if you could just kind of comment on that, you know, these yeah. different sides of the Great Lakes. I mean, there's the majestic nature side, but there are other things as well. Yeah, that's so true. I mean, I appreciate that you started out by saying people tend to think of the, the majesty because I think that speaks to how you and all of us are from here because people who aren't don't think of it as majestic. You know, they they think of, Chicago and you know how just the metropolis and you know that they, they I don't think people realize how wild and spectacular it is and I mean you know I think it's you know it's not the Rockies you know it isn't such a kind of sublime wilderness in that way that you know like American wilderness is is not considered the Great Lakes it's considered the West and you know, I think that's really interesting because, of course, like you said, there is all that here, but it's never too far from a power plant or, you know, a broken down pier or, um, and, you know, you can say that about a lot of spaces, but that just seems to be really very much, you know, that natural culture, cultural overlap is like, you can't look away from it, you know, and you would, you sort of just have to re reckon with it. And I think that that's what this book is trying to do at every turn. Um, as it's doing, you know, a few other things, but um, yeah, I th you know, that's why I think of it as it's kind of like contemporary nature poetry because it is, it is about, it is about nature, but really having to go through a, a few other, you know, you have to go through a lot of things to get to it and sort of really like get a get a good look at it. But when you know where to go, I mean, yeah, it's so easy too to just kind of so easily, you know, pull over, get out, and there you are on these like really gorgeous stretches all over the region. Mm -hmm. And maybe I'll kick it over to you for another Yeah. Question. Um, Love, I can't believe you called your work, your poetry lazy because the, <laughs> the, those beautiful words are all just assembled in such an amazing way. Um, and I, like you, Jen, appreciated hearing you, you, you say the words aloud because I think that's really impactful. Yeah. But so one thing I wanted to ask, so you you got to visit all around the watershed and you took this amazing trip. So just process wise, were you like writing every day? How did you capture all of these experiences? Because it feels really, when you read, it felt really immediate, like I was there as you were experiencing it. So how, can you just yeah. talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, 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 it's almost frustrating. Like I didn't have a very good process. Like I was always, you know, carrying around, look, 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 look at this, by the way. I love, I found like eight of these in some weird store. <laughs> in Bot I don't know what corporation this is, but I've claimed it. But, you know, all kinds of different sized notebooks. And, you know, it was, 
I was doing a lot of site specific writing, you know, moving through, pulling over, writing, spending a few, you know, nights whenever I could, you know, somewhere doing a lot of kind of just on site writing. And it was really freeing to just think about this, like as a, a project of just rendering, you know, like mm -hmm. let's render this space. I want to remember it, you know, and I want to be able to um, kind of compile renderings on top of each other. And it, that mm -hmm. kind of freed me from thinking that I had to write like, you know, this really masterful kind of mm -hmm. very wonderful perspective on the region or on, you know, where's my Chicago poem or, I mean, you know, but the book kind of in a way then maybe falls into a lot of really small, you know, minuscule. I mean, it, it, it's very concrete, you know, like it, mm -hmm. it doesn't work. I just don't think the, the language is very esoteric, you know, it, it just yeah. is details, details, details and associations and memories. And there are a lot of concepts and ideas in there but mm -hmm. it, it's more concrete, you know? And I think that comes out of just a real like enthrallment with just being out there and wanting mm -hmm. to render it and, and, and remember it and, and hold it and think about it. So mm -hmm. for better or for worse, you know, that's what happened. And I think a lot of it also fell away because my process wasn't very rigorous. You know, like I'm saying, I just had you know, pieces of paper that would fall apart or I wrote on the back of like a state park brochure and then where did I put it? And, but you know, <laughs> en enough came through. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for answering that. I, I do have a very specific question of one, something you said in your poem, the one about science where you kind of parse through, you know, the visits to all the different museums. You said that you found environmental discourse to be suffocating. That kind of like... <laughs> really kind yeah. of struck me. I'm curious if you want to, could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, if you want. Yeah. But... <laughs> no, I mean, that's, it, it's, I was maybe just trying to put a too fine a point on it, but you know, we are in a time where we're being bombarded with a lot of urgent issues. Mm -hmm. You know, we're seeing a lot of connections between human and, you know, non-human relationships and how things, you know, snowball and affect, you know. So like, I remember being in Toledo and for example, and I, this was in 2015 and I was, I got to spend time with someone who was doing like an organization who was doing a lot of like urban remediation and, you know, rain gardens. And so she was showing me around and it was like really amazing. And she was just so knowledgeable, you know, about mm -hmm. all of, you know, just how she was, how these pieces fit together and the effect and, but you know, she kind of made a comment about how she like wouldn't take her kids to swim in Lake Erie, you know, mm -hmm. because of what she knew about Lake Erie. And then, you know, probably half an hour, you know, I spent like the day with her afternoon. And then, you know, sure enough, I mean, I, where else would I go? I mean, I just, I'm here to see the lake and, and, and all the places on the lake. And so, you know, I wound up at, you know, a couple of parks or beaches and just, you know, looking around and seeing all the people who were possibly obliviously diving in, jumping mm -hmm. in, playing, you know, it was just a real sad like tension, you know, that, mm -hmm. her, you know, the idea of ignorance being bliss, you know, mm -hmm. what's the opposite, you know, is, mm -hmm. is the opposite knowledge is, I don't know, depravity or something, you know, like you just deprive yourself of, you know, these really mm -hmm. phenomenal experiences. I mean, is that where we've come that that's what has to be? I don't know. But mm -hmm. so, you know, there's something about that that relates to your question, because it's just what all we know and all of the how urgent it is and you know our vigilance around you know we need to be vigilant and, and see some of these things through so that we can yeah. find ourselves at a better moment and it's just hard to that sometimes can be very punishing you know mm -hmm. so yeah. I think the book tries to kind of hold it at bay like mm -hmm. understand it but kind of get it out of the way too and jump in mm -hmm. yeah that's a good visual when I think about climate change. <laughs> Just mm. like same kind of, same kind of feeling. But Jen, I think we're getting pretty close to eight o'clock, so I think we should probably start winding down. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask you, Mohab, I know you're still, you know, actively traveling. You mentioned to us before we started the Zoom tonight that you're heading to Chicago tomorrow to give a reading at a bookstore. You know, so you're actively out and about in the Great Lakes, you know, reading from this book and talking to people about it. Yeah. Um, so you're busy, but I'm just curious what other things are in the hopper for you? You know, are there other projects? Because I know 
obviously yeah. you're a poet, but you do other things. And so I'm just wondering what is on your plate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are, I mean, I really, I don't know. Um, yeah, I know we're basically at time, so I'll just try to keep it brief. It's just, um, I should have maybe just hurried up and started working on another book. You know, I think that's a real career move, you know, but I couldn't, I just, all I wanted to do was get back out and go run around to all these places and just somehow gently push everyone to have a poetry reading in, you know, Muskegon, please let's do it. Who's going to show up? I don't care, but let's just do it for the record. And so, and yeah, tomorrow I'm going to Chicago. It's been, you know, I've really prioritized all of the small places because I was just so excited to show up back to these other smaller spaces and the big cities. I was like, oh, I'll get there some other time, you know, but incidentally, city lit books tomorrow in Chicago at 630. If you're anywhere near, please do come. Uh, a wonderful writer, Kemi Allaby, will be reading with me. Um, but um, yeah, so I guess I'm feeling kind of like a bit wiped out, you know, by this, but it really feels to me like it's completing the project. It started, you know, it's a conceptual project in that way. It's about inhabiting. It's about, you know, kind of, it's almost like a social practice project and in, in, in how much time was spent out there. So it's just coming to a slow end. You know, I hope to get to Canada because the border was closed for COVID for a long time. And I still next summer hope to show up and some, you know, I still haven't made it to Detroit. And there's just places that I'm like, it's an imperative to show up there. Um, so I, I'm feeling like a bit, you know, adrift with what else I want to do. Um, but I just have so many other projects I do want to start, you know, poetry projects that still deal with like identity and wilderness. And, um, you know, they're sort of like poetry projects, but also um, might be a bit more like creative nonfiction, you know, with a bit more like digging into some like historical issues, because I find that so fascinating. So we'll see. Yeah. But I, I, I definitely am kind of chomping at the bit to like close up a little bit and yeah, get back to it. Yeah. I can see what you say though about kind of closing the circle because this collection comes out of travel and then to return to some of those places it seems very meaningful. Um, so yeah. I am just going to read one comment in the chat. Um, yeah. Cody says, this has been a wonderful presentation. Thank you for sharing your work with us. I concur. So thank you, Mohab, for being here. This is a nice way to close out uh, the Lake Talks for the fall. This is the final one of the fall. Oh, wow. we'll be back. Yeah, so we'll be back in the spring. But um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the hour, um, this will be on YouTube. Um, well, it won't show up right away, but we'll get it up there in you know a week or so. Um, so if you do want to watch any part of this again or share it with a friend, you can look at the YouTube channel for Wisconsin Sea Grant. And you can also catch up on some of the other lake talks from the season. Um, we had one about flood resilience in Wisconsin, one about Wisconsin shipwrecks, and then the one right before this was another uh, co-production with Anne, where we talked about a book club that she's starting um, that is children's literature by Ojibwe authors on Great Lakes themes, and that's a book club that she's kicking off in next spring. So if people are interested in that, um, definitely follow Wisconsin Sea Grant on social media, because you'll find out about things like that and other events that we have coming up. Um, but I just wanted to say thanks again to everybody who's here tonight. We really appreciate you being here with us um, across the internet, still in these kind of strange Zoom times. Um, someday we'll go back to doing these in person, but in a way it's nice because Mohab's at home in yeah. Minnesota and we're here and we can all be together yeah so, thanks again thank you Burke. thank you everybody yeah. thank you yep. all right yes thanks everyone i will go ahead and close out the zoom but good night everyone thanks good night. bye